Fiona and Fiona Bruce. Lots to discuss tonight. The autumn statement, a real tax cut, as the government claims, or just a small reduction in the overall highest tax take on record. Then there's the immigration figures today and a certain political figure in the jungle. Tonight we're in Stevenage. Labour have run the local authority here for a long time, but the constituency is Conservative held. But our audience here every week, as always, reflects the overall electoral picture across the nation. Welcome to Question Time. Griffith was made Science, Innovation and Tech Minister just over a week ago. Before that, he had various roles in the Treasury, as well as directing policy at Boris Johnson's number 10. He was only elected to Parliament in 2019 after a successful business career that included senior roles at Sky and Just Eat. Alison McGovern is Labour's Shadow Employment Minister. She was elected MP for South Wirral over 13 years ago and served on the Treasury Shadow Fund bench before leaving when Jeremy Corbyn became leader. The journalist Isabel Oakshot is a self-styled scoop getter and feather ruffler. Currently Talk TV's international editor. She's worked for many of the country's leading newspapers. She's also written several books, mostly about politics, her most recent with Matt Hancock, about his time as health minister during the pandemic. And the award-winning fashion designer and businessman Patrick Grant is no stranger to TV. He's one of the judges on the Great British Sewing Bee. And he's built a reputation for turning around struggling tailoring firms and has gone on to build a business empire in fashion and textiles. Good evening, welcome to our panel, welcome to our audience here at Stevenage, great to see you and of course welcome to you at home. You can watch or listen to the programme at a time of your choosing on the iPlayer or on BBC Sounds as you wish and you can of course join in the debate on social media as well. Now, we'll start with our questions. The panel, as always, do not know the questions, so let's hear the first one, which is from Emily Grace Hughes. Hi, um, how much will the Chancellor's autumn statement do to alleviate the reality of the cost of living crisis? Emily, I'm going to start with you. What do you think? Um, I think it's a bit of a token gesture to sort of lure voters in the approach to the election. I think that we are coming out of an economic crisis where interest rates are soaring. And to say, oh, the taxpayer is getting so much money back after such sort of long term financial struggle just kind of feels like a kind of quick release to lure voters back into the Tory party, basically. Well, Andrew, it doesn't sound like you're going to lure. Uh, Emily there, how, how would you persuade her? Well, look, the thing we found out this week from the forecasts is that the UK economy has been more resilient than everybody forecast, and that's given the Chancellor of the Government the chance to make some decisions. And I think those are long-term decisions. I don't think they are the short-term things uh, that people talk about. The ability to make work pay, the fact that we've been able to increase the national living wage to its highest ever level so that all of those people in work that may include you Emily uh, will benefit from that that's not a short-term decision uh, we've been able to reduce national insurance yes taxes have had to go up and they went up because of the tough decisions to protect everybody and to protect the economy during the ravages of Covid uh, and then the shock the shock rise in energy prices uh, as a result of Putin's war in Ukraine so that's why taxes had come up but this government does believe, I believe as a Conservative, that where you can and where we have the headroom to do so responsibly, it is right to let people keep more of what they earn. That's how you grow an economy. You can't spend your way to growth. That's the difference between Alison's party and my party. We've not been making incontinent spending promises over the last year. We've had to make some really tough decisions. I'm glad they're working. We're not out of the woods in the economy, which is why we've got to strike a careful balance. Uh, and what we did this week was try and improve the ability for businesses to get people back to work. We may talk later on uh, about migration. We've got to wean ourselves off that. We've got to make work pay for people in this country. And secondly, we've got to and tackle the long-term productivity that? Do you think you're, challenge do you think you're making by rewarding work, those businesses do you think that you're make, Do you think you're making work pay by taking the overall highest tax take on record? Well, I think if you look at what we've done, for example, to the national living wage since 2010, so over the life of this government, we've increased uh, in real terms, in real terms, 25% for those uh, who are working hard. We've now gone further 
and cut their national insurance. So at the end of January, everybody who's on an average wage will be £450 a year better off as a result of that. I regret the fact that that follows a period in which we had to put taxes up. And I think, actually, most people understand why that was the case, because we put in £400 million, pounds, billion pounds, during COVID to protect the economy and to mean that we do have the growth opportunities that we've got today. The growth opportunities I saw here earlier, okay. well, I think earlier time when I went Andrew, to... Andrew, I think... Oh, yeah, oh, I'm only, I'm only getting interrupt. Sorry, sorry, no, I'm only getting interrupt. Forgive me. Because yeah. as you're speaking, yeah. hands are shooting up all yeah. over the place. Yeah. So keep them up. I will come to you, Alison. Let, let me let you get a word in first. I'm going to try and be quick because those hands have been going up. I mean, look, the difference between our parties is the record. And we have seen today that this parliament will, in fact, be the first where incomes are lower at the end of it than they were at the beginning. And I think that that is a shocking record. I think you don't... I mean, we can pour over the data that we got from um, Treasury and OBR this week. But I know in my own constituency, the food banks that were once just about the odd emergency food parcel here and there are now part of the fabric of our society. And I don't think that that's right. I think charitable efforts should be an extra rather than something that people are relying on to get by. And I think that... Thank you. And I think that... I think that in terms of making work pay, it's been a disaster. The government's own review found that only one in six people on low pay ever really leave it. So... It's, we're not helping people move on and move up in work, which is a massive problem, and that's got to change. But I think, look, I think the evidence of the last 13 years is all around us, and there was nothing this week that I heard from the Tories that that's about to change. Okay. Faster than Germany oh, for the okay. last 13 really? let's, years. Let's hear a bit from... Oh, there's lots of hands up, and I want to hear from some. Yes, the woman here in the black and grey top. The National Insurance Class 2... Um, you know, that they've basically said that they'd stop paying, we have to pay. That's for the self-employed? For the self-employed. I'm self-employed. But £3.45 a week is nothing. It's, it's £180 a year. Me, personally, I don't think that's particularly high. Um, I'd much prefer it to have gone to the NHS, personally. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, waste of, it's a waste of um, legislation. It's £180 per person. It's ridiculous. OK, and there's a woman right at the back. I can't quite see with... Uh, uh, yes, OK. Yes, you in the yellow top. <clears throat> How is raising the minimum wage, which actually the government doesn't pay, business has to pay, help businesses? Patrick, I'm going to come to you for that in a minute. <laughs> yes, and there's a woman on the other side with their hand up. Yeah. Making work pay, it's, it's a lie. I work in a public sector job. I earn just above minimum wage, and yet I rely on a universal credit top-up to be able to pay my bills. Um, the £400 you say I'm going to be getting back from the national insurance uh, cut is a third of, of what I rely on. Um, from the universal credit payments across the year. So you're not helping me at all. And it, you're just telling lies to make yourself feel better. You're not helping... So it's helping you a bit, but not enough. It's not helping me enough. To, to, it's not going to make any difference at all to me being able to pay my bills over a year. And you say you work in the public sector. What job do you do, if you don't I, mind me asking? I work for the council. You work for the council. OK, and there's a man just a little bit further down with the glasses on there, yeah. £20 billion from the public sector funding is what is being lost. So I also work in the public sector within the health service. And the ability for the health service to make use of that funds has just been stripped away. And I think it's inappropriate and untimely. OK. Isabel. Look, this autumn statement was an absolute con. You should not be deceived by the load of spin that we've just heard there. The statement purports to be helping working people, but actually for every uh, pound that you're getting back under these so-called tax cuts, the Chancellor has taken four pounds. So when you study the small print, it's actually much worse for working people. You have dragged four million more people into the 20% tax rate. Those are working people, the type of people that you want to continue in their jobs and for whom you want work to pay. At the same time, you've put up benefits by 7%. That's net of tax. Again, that makes benefits more attractive. It purports to be, it purports to be a budget 
for businesses, a pro-business budget, and yet you've put up corporation tax from 19 to 25. How can that possibly be a pro-business budget? Well, none of, the, none of those things, Isabel, are things that we announced this week. What, what oh, we, we'd but had they to, are still what, true, what, aren't they? What, what we'd had to do, uh, and people will make their own mind up, but what we had to do as a result of the unprecedented level of public spending, right, that we made during COVID uh, and then after the energy bills went up, people talked about the cost of living. £3,300, half of everybody's energy bill, is what the UK government has paid last winter and the winter before. Um, now, that had to be paid for, uh, and I think people understand that. So, well, if you didn't in, take so, so much in at, tax, they might be able to pay for it themselves. And, and, at, the, and, at, the spring budget, and at the spring budget, <laughs> at the spring budget, when there wasn't headroom, we had to make those tough and difficult decisions, and that's how we managed to okay. bear down on inflation. The forecast that came out this week... Were dire. Said that, said Were that, dire. Said that that plan, said that that plan has worked. The economy is a more resilient than the independent forecasts that were made in, in, the, in the spring. It's literally bumping and, along the bottom to, yeah. for the foreseeable to, to your, future. To your point, Isabel, about trying to relieve the burden of tax on people, mm. at the first opportunity, when there was a chance to do that, and still having supported the most vulnerable uh, by increasing things like pensions, and universal credit, there was still headroom to start to let people keep a little bit more of what they earn, which helps everybody, <laughs> I 27, think, I think 27 think the million people... Stupid. Well, it's all... It's <laughs> OK. 27 million people... Let me bring people, some others in. I don't think they're stupid, actually. I think, I think you do. I think people Otherwise, you wouldn't carry I think on trying to con people. I think people understand the tough decisions that we Well, we will find out, because I'm going to come back to more of you in a minute. But Patrick, let me come to you. First of all, the question, Emily's question is, yep. how much will the Chancellor's autumn statement alleviate the reality of the cost of living crisis? But also, I wonder if you'd mind addressing the point in terms of how it affects business, because there were things in here for business, yep. but then the woman at the back was making the point about the minimum wage. Yep. OK. Well, I'll, I'll start with how much I think it will alleviate the cost of living crisis, and I think the answer to that is nothing at all. Okay. I think the cost of living crisis is, is, is a result of several things that have been going on for a very, very long time. I mean, we have... Um, uh, energy prices have gone up dramatically, uh, which we, we claim is not our fault, but, you know, we've had 20-odd years to be investing in alternative energy. We sold BP, which was a big energy company that might have helped us not uh, pay quite so much for oil. Um, we've had... If you look back at, at, at the overall economy, there's, a, there's, an, there's an economist called Joseph Stiglitz that a friend of mine wrote a book with. He won a Nobel Prize. And he sat down and he plotted everybody's income for the last 50 years, and he normalised it to a 2015 number. And the top 1% of people in this country and also in America, they have seen their income rise by about 4.3 times. 90% of us, that is probably most of us in this room, with the possible exception of one or two people on this panel, uh, you know, um, our incomes have re remained exactly the same. So for 40 odd years, of all of the things that all of the politicians have done, and we've had mostly Tory in that time, we've probably had three quarters Tory and a quarter Labour, but for all of that time, nothing that they have done has made any difference to everybody, to people's wages. And in the same, at the same time, the cost of things has gone up. We now pay 30% of our income in rent, and at the beginning of that period, we paid 10%. So we are all absolutely, totally worse off. And then we get energy price rises, and it, of course, it hurts everybody. And it, well, it doesn't hurt everybody, but it hurts 90% of people. And so that's what I have to say about that. Sorry. But on, um, <laughs> Get it off your chest, Patrick. No, Come on. I, yeah, I'm one of those people. I mean, I don't pay myself a great deal of money. Thank you very much. But, and in terms um, of... Was it, no, the there, were things, the, there were things the, for business in The things this for business. Also, Sorry. same. Did you welcome some of those? Well, the minimum wage is a really, really tricky thing. In principle, I am absolutely behind a minimum wage. But I think the difficulty we face at the moment is... Minimum wage is going to have to be borne by companies, as the lady rightly pointed out, uh, by companies, as the lady rightly pointed out. Now, most of those companies have had to spend the last two years struggling to pay their energy bills, struggling to pay other rising costs that they've had to, uh, to put up with, uh, raw material costs. All of the costs of business have gone up dramatically, but energy is absolutely killing them. So millions and millions of businesses, or hundreds of thousands of businesses across the UK, are already at breaking point. Now, what will happen if their wage costs go up, they will have to pass that on to the consumer, which will mean prices which will go up, which means inflation will start to go back up again, or they will have to cut jobs, which means that joblessness will go up. Now, neither of those incomes, I suspect anybody in this room, is interested in. So it isn't going to work. It's not going to have a positive effect. 
I'm behind it, but you have to do it in a way that allows it to work throughout the economy. So that's, yes, that's me on that one. OK, OK. <laughs> Over here in the front. Yes, you. How can uh, the gentleman understand the cost of living crisis, living in his £10 million mansion, when people are struggling day to day? How can him or anybody in his government actually understand what it's like to be in those shoes? So, have you been looking up where Andrew lives, then? Yes. Right, OK. I think that's and a bit unfair. Somebody else has got a £10 I think million that's a bit mansion. Well, you, you get out quite a lot, let, let, let me Let me tell you. Man of the people. I went, I went, to, <laughs> I went, to, I went to my local comprehensive school. Um, my parents worked all the hours God sends. I worked really hard. I was the first person in my family to go to university. Uh, I've worked hard throughout my life. I've been also very lucky. I decided, as a point of public service, unusual these days, to come back from business uh, after a 25-year career and to try and lead this country to make it successful for my children, for your children, for your grandchildren. I think this is a wonderful country. I think we have the best scientists, we have the best creatives, the best designers. But it's absolutely true that there are long-term challenges. We have outgrown France, Germany, Italy and Japan. We're one of the fastest growing countries in the G7, but we're not one of the fastest growing countries in the world. And I want us to be have a more prosperous future. Can I just that pros that, briefly, that prosperous really future, really on that point. prosperous future is on the back of having really successful businesses. Okay. That's going to grow the overall pie and allow okay. us to have high quality Andrew. public services yeah, and just, a good just income. Just in defence, Andrew, I really don't think we should talk down to success. That is one I, of the things that we do down. in this, and we should no, not do no. that. Good for you if you've got a big house. I'm a, I'm a child of migrants in this country. My father worked 21 years in the same factory, never claimed any benefits. I'm educated. My parents are totally illiterate. Two of us have got degrees. I've run two of my own businesses. So I'm not talking down success, but I'm asking Andrew, does he truly understand what it's like to be on that bread line? Okay. Well, Andrew's spoken a lot. Yeah. I want to bring other people in, if you'll forgive me, I'll come yeah. round. Yes, the woman there in the green top with the glasses. Yeah, 25 tax rises under the Conservative government. So what was given yesterday, in the statement on Tuesday, was given away, partly. Um, for me, it doesn't feel like this country is great anymore. There's lots of things that are broken. Um, and it feels hard for everybody, regardless of how much income they have. Now, look, in the interest of balance, I'll say this periodically, because I haven't heard a single voice in favour of what they heard yesterday, and maybe there isn't one. But let me see if there is anyone. So take your hands down just for a sec, unless, unless you are about to make the... Does anyone here feel... How can I put it? More optimistic about the coming years following yesterday's statement. Yes, you, you sir. Yeah. So hang on, how many hands have I got up here? <laughs> One. OK, but let's... <laughs> good for you. Don't be intimidated. Let's hear your point. And then, of course, I'm going to come to the rest of you as well. Well, I must uh, first of all apologise. Um, I run a company that manufactures, um, and we manufacture actually in Hertfordshire, and we sell our products um, in the UK and all over the world. Um, so we, we work very hard to, to build our business, and um, we're pretty successful at that. The way I look at things is that over the past five, ten years, um, the country has had some massive economic storms. Um, and we were all very happy to accept the furlough money, and we were all very happy to accept the handouts that were there from the government. The reality is that was all borrowed money. And the reality is that money has to be paid back. Then along comes Ukraine and the Ukraine war, and energy prices just go through the roof. That's not actually the UK government's fault. But nevertheless, a decision was made to try and support the cost of energy um, and to keep prices down for all of us, and myself included. But at the end of the day, that money has to be paid for. So. Um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough for us and it's tough for many, many other people. But I do think that actually you've got to be realistic and recognise that money has a cost and you have to pay it back. And that's where I'm coming from. OK. <laughs> and incidentally, just for clarity, when I said good for you, that's not because I'm supporting your view, but I know it can be hard when it looks like the audience is all going one way to put your hand up and take a different view. So, and I'm always interested in hearing different views. The woman there in the blue shirt. Thank you. I have every empathy with what the gentleman's saying and I'll, why I understand 
running a business, all of those costs, and it all has to be repaid. But we are in a situation where the awesome statement left no opportunity for growth, no stimulus for any, you know, any industry that I can see. Without that growth, we don't move forward. So let me just come to a point which is made by um, a person at the back and, and also you were talking about here about how you'd rather than getting that little bit of money back, you'd rather it went on public services. So Labour obviously very much hope to be in government next year. You're Keir Starmer, very trying very hard to, to look prime ministerial. One of the things that has come out of the <laughs> budget, out of the statement rather, that we saw yesterday was a squeeze on public spending, a big squeeze on public spending. What should Labour get into government this year? What will you do about that? How will you find money for public services? Well, it, it's exactly the point that you can't have a strong economy without strong public services. And because of that, we've identified um, sources of income that we could bring in, particularly um, this loophole for non-DOMs and other areas where there are the taxes that, you know, frankly, there are places where people are not paying taxes where they should. So can we just and look we into to... that? Just let's look into that little bit of detail because the, at the moment, public services are facing... Well, just to look at the maths of that, because I heard Rachel Reeve was making the same point yesterday. So public service departments are facing real terms cuts of 13 billion next year, rising up to 21.7 by 27, 28. So that's, that's from the Institute of Fiscal Studies. So let's take next year, that's 13 billion. So abolishing the non-DOM tax status, for example, will raise 3.6 billion a year. Now, 2 billion of that you've already allocated to breakfast clubs in primary schools and to train more NHS staff. So that leaves you 1.6 billion for a shortfall of 13 billion. How's that going to work? Well, it's... So I don't think that that, that non-DOM tax um, loophole closing that um, covers all of that because the maths is obvious, as, you, as you've just set it out. So how, but how my, the, point, the, it? The, point that, the point that I'm trying to make is that we have identified areas where we can definitely shut loopholes and bring that into our public services because we need that. I'm not going to sit here now and write Labour's manifesto on television. No, but it's, but a big, I, it's a bit. Let me reason just, I pointed out. Hang on a just, second. It's just because these things are often mentioned. You yeah, no, VAT on schools, but, but, but they raise I'll, a fraction of what looks like I, a big gap I know. in public in my spending. Own, in my own area, I'm Shadow Minister for Employment, responsible for job centres and the schemes that are help, supposed to help people get into work. I've looked into those schemes and I have identified underspend and waste. So rather than trying to spend more money, we want to spend the same amount of money different, differently. Forgive me. In policing, um, Yvette Cooper has identified areas where she thinks that the money has been spent inefficiently. So we will also need to spend the resources that we've got differently. It's a complete I non know, answer, I have to no, say. This I'm is sorry. a load of absolute flammel. I mean, where is the I, money come from? I'm, you don't know the answer. I can so, tell that you do not know the answer to the I, question. You don't know the answer. I, as I said, I'm not going to sit here and write our full manifesto and explain every detail. But what I'm trying to say is that we have identified areas where we can do it, and I understand the pressure that public services have been under. We can see the consequences of that. But I don't think, you know, it's... We've had 13 years of Tory government, this is the result. What we're trying to do as a responsible opposition is to piece by piece identify where we can bring resources in that are much needed for public services. But when, when Andrew says, you know, the difference is um, that uh, we want, you know, just lavish public spending, that is not the case. Judge, judge political parties on their record and at the end of the last Labour government, we had achieved great things on waiting lists and in our schools and had real successes. And at the end of this 13 and a half years now, we've got a situation where people are less well off than they were before, which has never happened in a parliament before, and our public realm is absolutely crumbling. And that is the truth about the record. OK, I'm going to... St sticking with the autumn statement, I'm just going to take another question um, from Catherine Hughes. Catherine, where are you? There you are. Is the carrot or the stick the most appropriate tool to help people with disabilities back to work? So th what you're referring to, Catherine, I'm assuming, is uh, something that was mentioned in the autumn statement yesterday, which is the government wanting to tighten up criteria for who can claim the highest level of incapacity benefit. And your view on that is? 
I think I wholeheartedly agree with Jeremy Hunt in that um, people who are not working for reasons of illness or disability are a hugely missed resource. However, I think that a truly compassionate government would headline on removing the barriers for those people returning to work rather than the punitive measures which were outlined in the statement. OK. Patrick? Well... I think we have a really, really fundamental problem in the way our entire education and, and uh, uh, economic system is established. We have in this country a record number of job vacancies. Something like, something like what, five, six, seven hundred thousand job vacancies? Nine hundred thousand job vacancies. Now, I heard last year that Tories celebrated that number as if it was a good thing. There are lots of jobs out there. But it isn't a good thing. It's an absolute failure. Every one of those job vacancies is a failure of our system of education to prepare people for work. Every single person in this country ought to have the opportunity to have an education that gets them ready for some job. Everybody should contribute. Nine million people in this country have no job. Now, those, that is what are called the economically inactive. It is a number that was invented, I think, after Thatcher shut the coal mines to hide how bad the unemployment figures were. Nine million people. It's something like 25% of all working age people don't have a job. And that I think, I think in that nine million, Patrick, that also includes students and, and the retirement. So it's seven yeah. million. The figure, the figure is seven million excluding students. OK. Still, seven million people is a very, very large number of people. And I think that is a failure of our education system. Like, you know, we're talking, about, we're talking about a school system that, you know, last year, British United said all, all, all pupils should do maths to 18. Well, I don't think they should. I think Have we got quite far from the question, Patrick? <laughs> Sorry. But so the question is, is the carrot or stick the most... Well, <laughs> forgive me, Patrick, because honestly, we're on a roll with you. I mean, it's fascinating. Is the carrot or stick the most appropriate tool to help people with disabilities we, back we, to work? The That's point the question. Is we should, we, everybody should have an opportunity to work. That's my, my point is, everybody should have an opportunity to work. We should help them all back to work by educating them. And if we've, they've got past school age, you know, every bit of help we should do, because every person okay. who is not working is a wasted opportunity for them personally All and right. for us as I think the time. question is about how you get them back there, Isabel. Um, I mean, I didn't hear that much of a stick. Maybe I'm just very hard line on this, but what I heard is that people would have two years in which they would be fully supported to get a job. And I don't think it's good for people to be out of work. It's not good for their morale. And I think that people on disability benefits and sick pay are an enormous untapped resource and it is better for them if they can work, please, let's get them into work. And I don't think it's much of a stick to say if after 18 months of looking when there are that many job vacancies, you still refuse to take a job that you can do and you get another six months after that to still muck around, then we're going to take your benefits away. It's not unreasonable. OK, I think we're talking about two different things here. Yeah. Just because you've got, you've got people yeah. on, on, who, who are on uh, Job Seekers Allowance, say, and if they don't engage with the process after a certain period of time, their benefits may be cut entirely. And when it comes to incapacity benefits, so people who just are just unable to work, what the government is suggesting, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is tightening the criteria for that from next year, which I think is what you're, you're, so you're referring to. Um, so let's hear some of the people in the audience. Yes, I will come to you in a minute. Yes, one there in the green top. Hi, yeah, um... Going back to what this lady said about disability benefits and getting people back into work, I totally agree with that. But where's the incentive to get people to work full-time when really 16 hours a week will do you, you top up your payments through benefit, and then nobody has to work full-time? Yeah. I see it all the time. So do you think it should be a bit tougher? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely tougher on it. Help people that get back, want to get back into work, by all means, that's great. But a lot of people I've come across say, well, I can't do extra hours, I can only stay on 16 because it'll affect my benefits. Yeah. And that's so wrong. That's yeah. so wrong. OK. Person here in the front in the glasses, yes. Woman there with the blood. No, further back. Sorry, we've both got glasses. Yes, you. I want to know what you're going to help employers do to get disabled people into work because yeah. I am disabled and I face constant abuse for using a disabled badge, for using accessible toilets, and I have had periods where I have been 
out of work long term because I have been unable to work. During that time, I was having to sleep during the day, take multiple medications that made me drowsy and had significant side effects. And one of the biggest problems for disabled people on benefits, coming from somebody who's been through that system and come out the other side, is that what the government did was they stopped doctors being responsible for who could and couldn't work based on a medical need and they moved it to external agencies who have no medical training, who do not know that person and who cannot say with genuinely how that person can go to work. But how will, an, if I'm an employer running a factory, how are you going to support me in getting the right infrastructure in place, the right pastoral support in place to support this group of people moving through. It's a wasted opportunity. Mm. And you said, can I just ask you, you said you, you received abuse at work for having disabilities. I get abuse constantly. I get shouted at by the public constantly because the government and the media make disabled people out to be scroungers on benefits but, but just and so we're I'm, not. Just so I'm clear, so, not that I, they should be shouting, of course they shouldn't, but, but why are they doing that? I mean, what... When, when, you're, when you're at work, what are people criticising you for? Because how can I do a job if my medication is giving me side effects, if I'm needing to sleep? And then you're putting staff against each other. The employee right. can't mm -hmm. sack me. I, they have legal responsibilities. I can't do my job. My teammates aren't appreciative of the little effort I can do. There's not enough flexible working, even post-COVID pandemic. And the infrastructure is not there to support these people. OK, yeah. thank you. And the original okay. question was about carrot and stick. Um, and in, this, in the case of disabled people, because there's, there's two parts of this cohort, um, it's much more carrot. There's two and a half billion pounds uh, to try and help people back in the workplace. Society's duty to so, people So how would you help that, that lady there, then? Because you're making the very specific point, this is your life, this is how it affects you, and you found it really difficult. And even when you've been in work, the employer has not been sufficiently supported to make it that straightforward for you. Well, the, the, the lady's in work and it sounds like a, a, a terrible no, experience not. and discrimination. I'm self-employed because self -employed. I can't get yeah. a job in yeah. an employment situation. Right. So how so, would you so help her? I mean, if, it, if, it's, if it's about incentive, there's, there's a person right there so there's two and a half, that you could incentivise. So there's, there's two and a half billion pounds in the system now that we put, we've made available for the first time for uh, more coaching, uh, to make sure there's more treatment in place, uh, to try and help work employers identify opportunities uh, so that there's no longer the same stigma or um, discrimination uh, against people who are disabled. One in five people who are disabled uh, currently would like more work and is, are unable, perhaps like this lady, uh, to get it. Uh, and we know more generally how bad the societal outcomes are for people who grow up in workless households. One people are out of the workplace for a significant period of time. Every social metric uh, declines. So. It's the, the original question was carrot or stick. It's carrot in respect of disabled people. But, but we do have to reform a system where there are five and a half million people of working age, yeah. a real break on our economy, employers not being able to get the staff that they need. Uh, and we've got a million vacancies. And at the same time, uh, we're having to bring in very significant number of, numbers of people uh, through the immigration system. We've got to reform that. Uh, and that's one of the tough, okay. the tough, not always popular, but one of the tough <laughs> long-term decisions that was baked into this week's autumn statement. Right. So your shadow employment minister, yeah. a, how would you, how would you help this? What's your name? Sorry, Kate. How would you help Kate? So we need to really change the way job centres operate because one of the things that I've learnt, particularly listening to people with disabilities who have experienced very similar things, is how the job brokering and the conversations that happen, I don't think they really work at the moment. And in fact, Scope, the charity, have created their own employment service precisely because the government's is such a failure so that um, they can talk with disabled people and employers to try to shape um, employment opportunities much better and try and shape our workplaces so that we can include disabled people fully because it is such a waste of talent in our country at the moment. People with disabilities have a huge amount to offer our country and it, we've got this massive waste. And so can, I, can I ask, the, the announcement that was made in the autumn statement yesterday, which is to tighten up the criteria for those who can claim incapacity benefit and take... Uh, job seekers allowance or unemployment benefit away entirely from people who don't engage with the process. Is that something Labour would stick with or would change? So 
on the um, work capability assessment, the process is broken at the moment and the government have said they're going to completely replace it. And at the moment, we're waiting to see what they've got on offer. But on what Can I just, I just say you? what... What I would like to do is to see the process improved quite a lot because it's reams and reams of paperwork and often you get a poor decision the first time and it takes a huge amount of time. So we need to fix that broken system. There have always been, on the for people who are out of work, there have always been conditions in our system, right? So you... you and so I'm asking, would you keep the conditions that the government introduced yesterday? So on the issue of, um, they, they floated this idea of, um, you know, cutting people off and having yes. a knock-on impact on NHS prescriptions and things like that. Well, well I, I, their policy is, I mean, I'll keep saying the same thing, but what they're suggesting, I'll just ask you one thing, because I must bring this no, up. I very specifically, then, on the, on, the, on the policy idea that if, that if you're looking for a job, not if you're on an capacity benefit, if you're looking for a job, the, you're, on, you're on job seekers' allowance, and if you don't engage with the process after a certain period of time, your, your benefit will be taken away. Yeah, I, I, would, I, would Labour stick with that? No, I want to see what they're saying and how it's practicable first, and we haven't had those okay, details. So but from what I've okay. heard, I don't like it. But right. the thing that I would say on you this... Briefly, because I'm not... I'm not I must let... No, as well. Well, like, perhaps if I might just be able to speak, the, the point about the, the way the system works is you should have to engage. Of course you should. You should have to engage that's with that's it. And there's that's always... That's what they just said. Always, the there's is. always been consequences. But there's responsibilities on both sides, right? Two so years if you've is got, what people are If you've got offered. a responsibility to go in and talk to your work coach, they've got a responsibility to offer you real help. And I would say most people go in and talk to work coaches who are trying to go, do a good job, hamstrung by the government, because they've run down technical so I'm, education... I'm still not clear. Do and you they like have the policy let, or not? Do yes, we do have a policy. I'm explaining it. I, do you know, I can't I, exactly. it's, quite, it's quite a simple policy. It's if, really if, simple. If, no, and no, you've explained it already, didn't you, from Andrew, in the nicest possible way? I'll, I'll you've got, you. The government's got to give I people real you're help. You're not booing it. You're not booed that policy. The government has got to give people real help. They have a responsibility to do that, just as we all have a responsibility to work hard. Ladies and gentlemen, this hard. is your next government. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh. Great. <laughs> right. Cheers and some booze. I think that's what we heard there. I'm going to move on, take another question. I think that's the autumn statement done, at least for now, anyway. Um, let me tell you that Question Time is in Doncaster next week, and uh, we've got some of the people on the panel already. So we have Andrew Neal, uh, the comedian Zoe Lyons, and Esther McVeigh, also known or briefed out uh, from number 10 anyway as the new Minister for Common Sense. Brilliant. Make of that what you will. We can ask her. I don't know either. Anyway, if you'd like to be in the audience in Doncaster, or actually if you go to the website, you'll see a whole list of our locations, including just after Christmas in Oxford on January the 11th, I think it is. Um, go to the website, follow the instructions there, and come and be part of our audience. Come and join in. We'd love to see you. OK, another question now from Poppy. Poppy Gervin, where? Oh, there you are. Thank you. Um, with last year's net migration figures at an all-time high, is it time for the government to admit the system is broken? Right, so the last year's figures have been revised quite significantly up to three-quarters of a million. The figures for this year are a little bit down from that, 607,000. Um, but there's... Uh, no, sorry, 672,000. But there's quite a big margin of error. Yeah. So it might be revised up again next year, or it might, in fact, be revised down. It's, it's impossible, really, at this moment to say. Isabel. Um, look, I think these figures are an absolute catastrophe for the government. I think they're a catastrophe for this country. We are basically importing three-quarters of a million people a year at a time when we have got all these people on out-of-work benefits, many of whom would like to be able to take jobs. We do not need to be importing this many people. And if you are going to import three-quarters of a million people a year, you have got to build the infrastructure to go with it. You can't have mass immigration and not actually have the schools, the hospitals, the GP surgeries, the homes and the roads to support those people. So the impact of that is that the standard of living for everybody goes down. We've all seen the impact on public services. And this is a government that has time and again told us that it is going to bring down net migration and has time and again done the absolute precise opposite. They have presided over mass migration. You have basically presided over open borders. 
You are letting people still coming in despite your stop the boats mantra. Every so single you, week, more people come in. What would you like, like to see migration? I would like to add? see net zero migration. Zero migration. Net, net zero. Net zero. Because I don't think we need any more people. So when you have situations like when, when you have the so national farmers, well, time, so when you have the national farmers union, for example, saying we need people to come in and pick the crops because there aren't enough people who live in this country who want that. to do it. I, well, they may not want to do it, but there are plenty of people who are capable of doing it. But, if, but, so but when there was when there was a scheme it. to try and get people to do it, hardly any British people. Have well, that it. comes back to our question before about whether we're incentivising people to take jobs. And as for, of so you course, think we're making it too easy for them not to we, do it? Is that your point? Of course, we need to have the brightest and best people here. I'm all in favour of that. You know, the NHS heavily relies on immigration, on brilliant doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals. We need those at the moment. Why? Because we're not actually paying our own healthcare professionals well enough or looking after them well enough to stick with the NHS themselves. Patrick, with last year's net migration figures at an all-time high, is it time for the government to admit the system is broken? Uh, well, I mean, it's... It's about the only thing we ever hear them talking about, and the fact that that is that they have failed to control that one thing that seems to be the only thing they really give a stuff about seems obviously like a failure of the system. It is... But it feels to me just incredibly sad because we... we you know, going back to the point I mistakenly made on the last <laughs> question, we do have lots and lots of people that don't have work. And I feel like we have to really take a broader look at what sort of... What sort of society we want? What jobs do we really value in society? You know, we pay certain people lots of money for doing jobs that seem very easy, and we pay people very little for jobs that seem incredibly difficult. Why are nurses paid so little? Why, you know, what do we as a society value in the jobs that, that, are, that are available? Because if we paid more, then more people would want to do them. But we've got to give people a chance to, to, you know, of an education that, that allows them to, to enter into these workplaces. Because at the moment we seem to be obsessed with preparing people for a life that goes, you know, university, A-levels, university, some sort of job. But what we're, we, it feels like we're, 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 we are letting down a very huge part of, of um, you know, young people by, by having an education system that doesn't give them broad stuff. You know, we've got, we're missing... You know, we've, we're, we're hundreds of thousands of plumbers and carpenters and builders short. Why are, why, you know, why are we not teaching plumbing and carpentry at school? Why, you know, yeah. what is, where is... Why, OK. Let's see if the, the man there in the grey shirt and the glasses. I think there needs to be a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of what people accept as um, an appropriate job for them to be doing within the country as a whole. But over and above that, coming back to the point that Isabel raised about the 672,000, 121,000 of those have been people who have been employed by the NHS. There are no people suitable to fill those roles at this point in time. So to turn around and say it's not appropriate to be bringing individuals in... I didn't say that, though, did I? I actually yeah. said quite the opposite zero, of that. I said net zero, zero, you said. Yeah, said. yeah but that, that's... Yeah, it doesn't mean nobody comes in. It means you balance how many come in with how many who go out. It but in a situation you where you don't have in. the people able to do the job, you obviously have so. to get them in. Okay. So the fact yeah, that the numbers are increasing... Fine. That's fine, as long as... I mean, every year, lots of people leave the country as well. Probably for good reason. OK, <laughs> thank you. Oh. The woman there, yes, in the same room. Yeah. Um, I just really think that this, the, the way... The kind of narrative around immigration is an absolute disgrace, to be honest. Um, and it's embarrassing. The way these people come here, they've been through, you know, a hellish ordeal and... Well, also, they, that's also a, lot of this is, a lot of this is I legal migration. Yes. So no, people, yeah. no, students, yeah. people coming here yeah. to work, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. But it's, it's the treatment. I don't know why anybody would want to come here. It's the treatment of people is, is terrible. What? Of legal migrants, you're saying? No, no, terrible. not of legal. Of but this, this asylum talking, seekers we're not you're talking about. about. Yes. Asylum yeah. seekers. Yeah. Yeah. All right, the man there with the white shirt and the dark jacket, yeah. Yeah, I think um, a lot of it's to do with the culture of the people in the UK. I don't, I don't feel like a lot of people in the UK want to work and then yeah. they don't want to work hard. So these jobs are left vacant. You know, a minimum wage job is just not majority of the time going to be filled by a UK-born person. Um, and that's what I tend to find. And it's not about education, I think. You can have many more educated people, but it's filling those lower roles and then building that up and also experience as well. 
you don't tend to find that that much anymore. And can I ask, are you an employer? Is that are you coming from that perspective? No, no, I'm employed, but um, right. I'm talking at the point as well of, of just general people that I find working at the okay. same level. Not a lot of people are proud of the work that they put out, you know. Okay. And it's hard to find as an employer as well. I, I empathise. It's hard to find people that want to do do the job properly. Okay, now, the woman there in the red and black. Hi there. I'd like to um, agree with the comments that I just had, uh, just heard, actually. Um, I'm a Canadian Brit, and I think I'd like to ask all of the panel, as long as we have a first class and a second class stamp, we're going to have this problem. Why don't we have next day delivery and two day delivery? It's, it's hang a you paradigm totally shift. Totally there. Just, just for, <laughs> OK, hang on a minute. You might need to explain, how, what has that got to do with it? Because I'm saying I'm that we need, we need a mindset change about what jobs we're prepared to do. And the gentleman said we have people that don't want to do certain things and do want to do it because we're sending children off to university. I've got three of them myself. And they come out with these expectations of what I can do. We've all got to do jobs from the bottom up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's an attitude. You. So you're talking about shift. first and second class stamps as a metaphor. Exactly. I'm with you. Oh, OK. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> I, I thought we were going to talk about uh, posties. <laughs> I know. So, Alison. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got lots of hardworking posties in, in my constituency. So, so, but, um, so we're talking about migration figures, and Keir Starmer has, has said that these, these figures are shocking, and they're shockingly high. The, it's a failure. The, and the, the question was, is the system broken? And I would say yes, because you shouldn't, as a firm, be able to say, we'll bring lots of people in unless you have got a programme to train people and to up their skills, pay people decent, decently, and be a part of our country and making our workforce strong. I think we've got to connect this to what we're doing on technical skills. And a couple of people have mentioned um, going to university on, or whatever. And I think, you know, whatever the institution you're in, we've got to really value technical skills. Actually, I know lots of people that I represent who work at minimum wage or nearly minimum wage. And they work really, really hard and they deserve respect for it. Particularly, you know, care workers, for example, often in my opinion, don't get paid what they're worth. So we've got to change that. So for me, this goes hand in hand with saying to employers, look, we've got to have a partnership here. And your bit of the partnership has got to be skills training and doing that properly. And the government has got to say, OK, we'll run job centres properly. And if you come in and you need help, we're going to say to you, not just get any job, but get the best job. Get a job with prospects. But, uh, get a job where you can just, hang one on really once. I'm going to finish. I'm going to yeah, finish my Alison point. Okay. You, you need a job with prospects where, yes, you can go in at the bottom, but you can work your way up to the top. And that is the change I think we need the government to do in our job centres. So Isabel, is, go ahead. Is, I just want to know if Labour is committed to lowering net migration. Are you committed to that? So we think that it will come down, but as are you the OB have, to do OBR has said, to and clearly taken. it should come down from the figures that we've seen. But, but the point is this. The, the problem I've got with what you were explaining is that the system that we've got for helping people get into work and move up, at work, up in work is completely broken. So whilst I understand the concern with the figures that we're seeing today, the bit of the system that's really broken is the one that fails our people okay. week in, oh, week no out, because no they can't okay. move up in work. No commitment. Andrew. So the, the big number conceals the truth. And, and the truth within this is that the right answer for the UK cannot be Isabel's net zero. Our NHS depends on it. We're an, a, an ageing population. Uh, and we're also trying to bring in the brightest and most talented people around the world. So that answer doesn't work for the needs of the United Kingdom, our economy and our prosperity. The answer that Alison's party have advocated in the past, which is complete open borders, doesn't work because it doesn't get employees to invest in skills. It doesn't let us build careers for people of the future. And it addicts business to too much cheap labour. That's the long-term choice that this government has made. The biggest tax, the lady said earlier... Well, the question, it, Andrew, the question earlier, is, is it nothing... time for the government to admit the system is broken? You're talking about was... what Isabel's saying and no, no, what no, Alison's I'm... saying. What about your own government? I'm, yeah, and, and I'm trying to talk about the long-term choices that we're making because by getting businesses... You don't and have long-term There was a huge, there was a huge <laughs> tax cut for those businesses 
that are willing to invest in productivity. Hey, well, well, hey, uh, Andrew, in, in, with the best, is, best one in the world, you are, you're way off topic. I'm not, I'm you not. are. On, is it time for the government to admit this is broken? I had Jacob rees on today saying, obviously a, a colleague of well, yours, saying, saying, I want to apologise because the immigration figures are too high and the Good. government is responsible. Yeah. That's yeah. his view. Do you agree? It, it is unsustainable, but with the greatest respect, I'm trying to explain how we get out of this unsustainable position. How can anyone trust I'm you? Trying... How can anyone trust you on this? Well, year after year after year. Yeah, you've sold Isabel, us a total Isabel, lie. Isabel isn't offering any answers. I am Isabel's offering, offering answers. Is offering the answers. Well, you're of... the elected politician, and you haven't given if, us any answers. And if answers. you if you don't interrupt me, I shall explain what we're trying to do. We want businesses to be more productive. We want them to invest both in training, uh, but also in having better capital intensity that allows them to make the employees that we've got here already more productive, to do more with less, like other countries do. That will mean that will mean that we don't need to rely, as this, don't need to rely. as this country, as this economy has for decades, on unlimited cheap migrant labour. You that have is, lost that control is, of the borders. That is, that that's is what's the way, happened. That is lost the way, control. That is the way forward, Isabel. That's what we did when the Chancellor yesterday talked about making full expensing permanent that allows businesses to invest, to, do with to, it. to build their factories, to make employees more productive, which allows us to have a high-wage, high-skilled economy. And I know I've gone on a little bit, but I just came today from, from Airbus. We're in Stevenage. We've got fantastic, high-skilled, high-wage opportunities for young people. This is the centre of UK space. It's also okay. the centre right. of UK Come on. Come on. We're getting off topic now. Therapy. Uh, now this is fairness, the future Andrew. we want to build. OK. Oh, I'm exhausted. I don't know. I don't know about you. Um, well, I'm going to get another question in. Because surprisingly, lots of you, or a surprisingly large amount of you, sorry, my English has deserted me for a second, a surprisingly large amount of you asked a question along these lines. So let's have one version of them. Uh, Russell, Russell Wilkinson. Yeah. Is the jungle the best campaign tool in modern politics? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is a jungle out like there. Who do we be talking about? <laughs> uh, so, obviously, Nigel Farage is in uh, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here night after night, um, eating sort of horrible things and being covered in horrible things. Um, and he's not the first... I mean, he's, he's, he's not an elected politician, um, but he's not the first person from the world of politics to be in it. Obviously, uh, from your own uh, party there, we've had Nadine Doris, we've had Matt Hancock, um, and actually quite a few of them. I won't go through the whole list, but quite a lot of them. Is it the best campaign tool in modern politics? I mean, lots of them go in, Patrick, saying this is the way to communicate to a far wider audience. And then, I don't know, have they... money, really. Have they, well, well yeah. have they got a point? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think the sheer balls of, uh, of Nigel Farage's agent to ask for a million and a half yeah. quid. I mean, when, when we're talking about cost of living crisis and all the rest of it... I thought you were referring to what shocker. he was eating yeah, yeah. there for a minute there. No. <laughs> well, yes, perhaps. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I... I I don't. I, I don't watch it. I'd rather see very. I, I'd rather never see anything of Nigel Farage uh, again. Although I, I understand he's got a certain serious, popular appeal. But making a, make, but making a serious, serious point for me because if you think yeah. about pol uh, politicians, I mean Donald Trump, for example, famously yeah. communicates uh, through social media, and that's what he, he prefers to do rather than engage in, in TV debates and that kind of thing. We've got increasingly polit uh, politicians, past and present, going on reality shows, that kind of thing. Is, I mean, is this, I think, is this I think the way need, it should be going? I, I think ultimately we, we, we could probably do, and, and I was interested to hear the point earlier about coming back into politics. I think, I think it feels to me like so many of our, politi our politicians are in it for the wrong reasons. I think many, many politicians now, I mean, when I look at the calibre of a lot of the people in government over the last 10, 15 years, and I've met very many of them. I met Hancock, he was my minister for, for a while. You know, lots of them felt like they were in it for their own advancement and not in it for the, for the betterment of the people they were supposed to serve. Okay. Um, Isabel. I mean, having worked at Westminster for absolutely ages, I actually disagree about that. I think most of them are in it for the right reasons. They just get it all very wrong. Um, well, they're just on, very bad at it, then. Oh, yeah, I think that's perfectly fair. On the um, I'm a Celebrity and the reality TV shows, um, look, I think if they are a serving an elected politician at the House of Commons, they should not be going into the jungle. There's a real difference between politicians that are not being paid by 
the taxpayer uh, to represent their constituents and those who are who are free to do as they like. Um, does it get the message across? I mean, we heard Nigel Farage valiantly trying to have a sensible debate about immigration uh, with one of the other contestants. It went absolutely nowhere. I don't think it was very illuminating. And I think that they pretend that it's not about the money when it actually is about the money. I remember Matt Hancock saying it was all about dyslexia. Um, it, it isn't. They get paid very well to do it. Um, by the way, I don't think Nigel's having a great time in the jungle. You know, I look at him and he looks very underfed <laughs> and um, a little bit tired and grumpy, frankly. So um, he's paying quite a high price, I think, for his reported fee. OK, let's hear from the woman, the woman there in the white... Hang on, we'll just get a microphone. The woman in the white top, yeah. Um, I think um, politicians going on these shows just goes to show how irre irrelevant they are to the majority of the general public because majority of the time, if you ask an MP a question, it, they often recite a script to you that has been okayed by their press Surely team. Not. And, and then going on these shows <laughs> is their attempt to be relevant. And the woman next to you. I think not just relevancy, but uh, redeeming themselves. You know, they go on there and as soon as they've eaten a camel's testicle, they're the nation's <laughs> sweetheart, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, it's one way to do it, my, my goodness <laughs> me. Um, Andrew. Uh, I can think of some people I'd like to send to a jungle. Oh, well, do let's hear. Uh, 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 from uh, your uh, own party? Uh, an option mm -hmm. to uh, allow. Now, look, I think that... First of all, the right forum, actually, to, to have debates about these really important matters is the sort of thing we're doing here tonight. Um, and actually, it's the sort of thing that members of parliament, for all that they get pilloried and all that sometimes people just see the very tip of the pyramid. I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie to, uh, to the SW1 postcode. We all think it's about Prime Minister's question time, which is 25 minutes of the week, and no one sees the vast iceberg underneath where people are working through the detail, collaboratively, trying to do the right thing, trying to bring uh, data and judgment to it, and then going back to their constituency and having incredibly intense and profound experiences every week in their surgeries to help local people. I actually think that's the system we've got. And if anything, I honestly think, as somebody's come to it afresh, uh, that we don't value that enough because we okay. really do have a good system where generally politicians are very, very well connected with the people they represent. Okay. Alison. I don't think I've agreed with anything that Isabel has said this evening, apart from what she just said then, that I think it's about the money um, as reported. Um, is it a good campaign tool? Well, I've like worked on lots of elections, um, and the best campaign tool is presenting yourself to members of the public and having an honest and frank conversation with them. That is the best campaign tool. No amount... I mean, we have a lot of social media in elections these days, but nothing replaces, in terms of winning someone's vote, actually having the courtesy to knock on their door and ask them for it and have an honest conversation with them. So I actually think it's a rubbish campaign tool. The woman here. Well, um, as I deliberately avoid all reality TV shows... It's certainly not going to work for me. Right. No, OK. I've got about 30 seconds. It's the woman there in the glasses. Can you see in the black jacket? Yeah. yeah as we're talking about standards in um, public services, um, is it then appropriate for the Home Secretary this week to be quite so derogatory about uh, a, a member of the opposition? Yeah. Ah, so that's a whole other topic. <laughs> what you're referring to is James Cleverly. Mm -hmm. uh, he was heard to be... He was accused of talking about Stockton, I think it was. Stockton North. Stockton, uh, and calling it... I don't think I can say this word on television, can I? Someone in my ear tell me if I can say... No, I can't. They say, no, I can't not, say that word. Okay. Nice Using place. a very rude word to yeah. describe that place. He has said, no, that was beginning with an S. He said he didn't say that, and he said he was actually referring to the MP, and he's apologised for that. Um, yes, that's a whole different subject. But let's... Given that I can't even say the word, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> and our time is up. So... Thank you very much to all of you for all your questions and all your input. Thank you to the panel, of course, and thank you to you at home for watching. Uh, remember, question time is on iPlayer at 8, if after the 10 o'clock news is too late for you. But otherwise, we will see you next week in Doncaster from Question Time. Bye-bye. <laughs>
This is a special message for everyone who supported 